Hi everybody, I'm Zilla Blitz and welcome to the second half in our historical what if exploration of the Battle of Antietam. We're using the tabletop war game Antietam Pub Battles to explore the question, what might have happened had General George McClellan been much more ambitious than his actual historical counterpart. When we left off at the end of our first episode, we'd battled through the first four and a half hours of the day. Let's jump in and do a quick recap of the situation and then finish the battle. Will a bold McClellan be able to lead to a greater Northern victory? Or will the South be able to hold off the North's attack, turn the tables and drive McClellan's army from the field? Let's jump in and find out. As we look at the battlefield here at 1130 on September 17th, 1862, one of the things to kind of immediately call into attention here is our first and perhaps, perhaps most pressing victory condition. Each side, if a side suffers 50% casualties, 50% uh, of their infantry units wiped out, they concede the battlefield, they lose the battle. Right now, the South has lost two out of five that they would need to lose the battle, and the North has lost three out of eight. So the South can only sustain three more infantry units wiped out, and they would have to concede the battle. Now, that brings to mind, I think, or brings to our attention, the second situation here, which is if just doing this bird's eye view of our battlefield from the top down, where we can see the North in blue to the bottom of the screen, the Confederate Army to the top of the screen in gray. Any unit you can see the label for is a unit that is in fresh status. And for that unit to get wiped out, it can take three hits. Any unit that you don't see the label for is spent. Now that unit can still fight and maneuver, but it sustains two hits, which is a much more likely outcome in any battle, it's wiped out. So you can immediately see the South's problem in that they've got very few units that are fresh and ready to go. One of the big objectives in this next hour and a half for the South is how can we get these units back into fighting shape and back up into the lines? And the second thing I would call out, and the North, to their to their credit, I think one of the things that North is, the North has done well, which we've kind of wanted to try to test with this battle, is to be relentless in their attacks on all areas of the Confederate lines. And they've pulled their baggage trains up to three places, which has allowed them to really quickly refresh troops and send them back forward to the battle. The North baggage trains are kind of aggressively towards the front lines. And this takes us back to another bigger observation in terms of what the Salt's predicament is. A lot of their strategy has hinged on holding excellent defensive ground. And if we look at their left flank, more towards the northern edge, or right side, as we look at this battlefield, they've done pretty well. They're holding high ground with Jackson's elite infantry on the very edge of their left flank. They still hold the West Woods, and they have some fresh artillery behind there to bring up and further strengthen that defense. The left side of the Confederate defense is good. It's solid. The problem is the right side. Some absolutely penetrating artillery fire from the north ripped apart the defenders in the sunken road, which we can see right here. Some tenacious fighting from both sides over the past hour and a half, leading to heavy casualties, has left the sunken road open for the taking to whichever side can seize the initiative and get up there and occupy it. If the South can't get there first, that leaves in the condition, where did they defend? Now there's a hill slightly to the, the west of there they might be, but there's really no good defensive positions in front of Sharpsburg. And Sharpsburg itself isn't a good defensive position because units that go into Sharpsburg would automatically be a spent status. It's just not a defensible position in a civil war battle like this. So the next hour and a half really hinges on the South refreshing troops and somehow trying to hold that sunken road or figuring out how they're going to hold their right flank. Further compounding the situation is that they had to pull units from the very right edge of the flank off of the hilltop just to the west of Antietam Creek. And right now the only unit they have holding that hilltop is a single unit of South detachments. They take one hit and they're wiped out. So the entire right flank of the Confederate Army is on the verge of collapse. Can the North be aggressive and jump into this gap, further creating problems for the South? That's why I think this next hour and a half as we go forward will be telling. So let's get started and move forward 
We'll be back after the units move. And just to kind of recap this in game mechanics terms, um, everybody moves. There's that kind of sequenced moving that we talked by command order. Everybody's going to move and then everybody fights. And so we'll go through and get our troops in position as we can over the next half hour and a half with both sides trying to gain control of the sunken road, push forward and regroup their forces, especially for the south. And then we'll see what we've got up for combat here. It's fair to say I think we're reaching the climax of this battle. It, it, incredibly interesting. Burnside seized the initiative as this hour and a half started off. I immediately tried to preempt him with Longstreet because I wanted to bring First Corps up here, refresh troops, and try to bring troops up into this sunken road. They need a one to four to succeed to go before Burnside. They failed. So then I said, let's try it with Stuart. Likewise, Stuart needs a one to four roll on a six side die to succeed. He rolled a six as well and failed. That let, left the North with a lot of places where they could grab the initiative and push forces forward. So basically this failure of command on the right flank to the South's right flank led to the North both capturing the sunken road, pushing forward and actually engaging some of these infantry units up here of the South as they were hopefully going to try to refresh. Now, the South is, South's baggage trains are right here. They were able to refresh Walker, some artillery, and Hood's elite infantry. The problem here, however, is that if, if this fresh Union infantry pushes, forces this unit to retreat here, their only path is through these units that are refreshing right here. That creates a cascading effect which will cause all of these units to be pushed back and spent, causing a further collapse of this flank of the Southern Army. Now they did get some spent infantry here to flank them, but likewise the Union was able to get some infantry up here to flank them. So we have an incredibly pivotal battle happening right here. Now back here I did charge with Fitz Lee's cavalry to try to push Sykes's infantry back across the river. That creates some problems here for the North, however they're quickly getting swept up in the North's kind of surge past them. And then our pivotal battle on the left hand side, Rodman's infantry pushing across Antietam Creek, taking on this unit of detachments. If they can wipe them out, they have a clear path to this baggage train here or behind the Union flank. And the other victory condition in this game, signifying kind of complete collapse of your army is if the enemy reaches a baggage train. So this here presents potential catastrophic situation for the South as well. And if we look just to get a sense of movement range, foot movement in one turn straight ahead would be from this point here to this point here. So it would take them you know, more than an hour and a half to get there. Plus they'd have to clear this hill, which causes a one third terrain movement way. So it's gonna take them a while to get there, but you're gonna basically have some Northern troops stampeding across to the south of Sharpsburg. That's gonna create more of a problem for this kind of collapsing Southern army. We'll go ahead and fight the battles. And we'll see what it looks like once they're done. So if there's any way to sum up the past round of combat, this, it was a wild frenzy of combat, but the South performed to some high distinction, giving themselves a fairly decent improvement of their position. Now, on this side of the front, Jackson's elite infantry drove back the Union infantry that had tried to take this position. That was the only a action up here. Let's focus in a little bit on what happened down here, because it went a lot of different ways. In the middle here, in this section in here, the biggest thing to happen was that the South averted disaster. Anderson's infantry, which was up in here, actually got wiped out. But in doing so, they actually fought heroically well and wiped out Williams' unit as well. So both sides losing an infantry unit in here. The subsequent flanking units and the remaining Union infantry that was up here got driven back. French's unit drove this unit back, this flanking unit drove this one back, leaving the space in here, but most importantly, creating a pathway for Hood, the artillery, and Walker. They are fresh and ready to re-engage in the battle. So disaster averted for the south down here. A little bit further to the south on the battlefield here, uh, the cavalry here, Fitz's, uh, Lee, Fitz Lee's cavalry here, wiped out a Union infantry unit in here over a couple of rounds of combat. Morell's unit was then able to push them back, but another infantry unit lost for the north down here. A little bit further to the south, Rodman's infantry was took some casualties but were able to wipe out the detachment holding the hill, so they have free movement forward this way to potentially create some problems for the south. As we head into the next round of combat, I think this combat round here definitely gave the South a glimmer of hope. There is a path, perhaps a pathway forward for them to be able to rescue their right flank and AP Hill is coming in as reinforcements. So the South has an elite infantry unit 
coming to their rescue. Now, historically, A.P.'s Hill's infantry did actually kind of save the southern defense here towards the south of Sharpsburg, um, and we'll see if they can fill a similar role in this combat. We'll go ahead now, push forward. The south going to try to reassemble their flank here as best they can, this right side as best they can, and try to keep on holding to the north. The north, again, trying to push forward, although they've got a tougher road now that these units are back in action. For the last hour and a half, I think this can be best characterized as reorganization. The North have been able to push forward past the sunken road to the outskirts of Sharpsburg. The South, it, it seemed like the best thing to do was to try to reorganize this defense on this flank. They retreated some cavalry, brought some forces over here, some of these fresh troops to basically form a line, and AP Hill has come in. So the South forming a new fresh line here. They moved their baggage trains back to try to get out of that dangerous collapsing on the right, and it looks like they have rescued their southern flank here. Now there is some combat. Doubleday again bravely charging Jackson, who has just held this hill all day long. And we have some infantry pushing forward to try to take out this artillery. Behind the artillery, is uh, just a unit of detachment, so another potential weak spot for the South right here. And we do have Hood's Elite's troop taking on a charge by the 9th Corps here. So we have a little bit of battles to fight out. We'll do those now and see how that changes the landscape. Some fierce fighting in the central here. Let's zoom in and take a look at the results. On the northern hill, Jackson holds again. This time they are exhausted though. They go to spend, they do drive back double day. Fierce fighting in the westwards. Got a little bit too aggressive with the north perhaps. Slocum's infantry wiped out. However, they were able to drive back the Confederate artillery and wipe out a unit of detachments. This creates another break in the line, but it does look like the south are gonna be able to draw a line. However, they've got a lot of depleted units for both sides in here. Fierce fighting down in here as well. Both Union, um, the Union positions were able to hold this position, although we, Wilcox was driven back. They did get Hood, which was an elite unit, uh, to be spent and push them back off this. So con contracting the Southern lines, but not really looking like any big uh, kind of breaks in the line at this point. Perhaps the most telling situation at this point of the carnage of the day has been the casualties. The South now have lost three of five infantry units that they can sustain, two more and they break. The North, however, by losing another one in this hour and a half in this battle in the Westwoods have now lost six of the eight that they can sustain. The next side to lose two infantry units loses the battle. Let's go on to our next hour and a half. How these fights in here rage out could determine who the victor is. It really feels like it could go either way at this point. As the afternoon sun hits four o'clock, basically we see the last hour and a half be a reorganization of troops, both sides preparing for one last frenzied charge. Now, technically what we could do here is we could have the North block, the, the South are just running out of troops, basically, is kind of what it is. But we could have the North block these supply lines at the end of the first day, which would lead to a night turn. Both sides would get a 50% replenishment of forces and we would continue on to the second day. But we're gonna resolve this in one day with one last attempt by the North to attack and blow through the Southern lines and perhaps get to a baggage train or wipe out two more infantry units or sustain infantry casualties as they go forward. One of the problems they're running into now is their baggage trains are far away so they would have to move back, refresh, move up before they could attack. So it would take a long time. So rather than bring the 9th Corps, which are all these three depleted units back and try to do that, there just isn't enough time to do that before the sun sets. We're gonna go forward with them in depleted status, which could lead to some, some dire circumstances, but I wanna finish this in the next three hours. So there is no fighting in this phase. The artillery had to move and reposition, nobody basically dared to close the game. And we're gonna go now to our next hour and a half where the attacks should go. A big question mark is, can either side's artillery fire before other units can close on them? Because artillery could potentially blow some holes in the Southern line or take the sting out of the last Northern charge. So lots of initiative questions as we go to this next hour and a half. We'll play through to four to 5.30. We'll be back momentarily to see how the movement ends up. As the day winds towards half past five, this attack went about as discoordinated for the North as it could possibly be. One of the things that you see with this system is you know, that preempting of initiative and the delaying of initiative can really make a huge difference and everything went wrong 
for the North. Their artillery didn't fire on time. They couldn't coordinate that. They finally did get some artillery to bombard and actually blow a hole through the southern lines here. But then the southern cavalry was able to fill the hole. And just timing-wise, it was a just a total disaster for the North. They are in a, a desperate position here to try to close out the victory. Our overly aggressive and ambitious McClellan might actually be throwing uh, more than just caution to the wind and be falling firmly into the reckless category. We have four northern attacks on the southern perimeter here. We're going to act them up. We have green troops running up a hill. We have exhausted and spent troops running into elite troops. Likewise over here we have some spent troops running into artillery. This could be the end for the north. I, I, I fear that they could very easily lose those last two infantry units which would have them concede the field. Let's give it a go though. As the clock strikes 530 and the sun is setting, this madness on this hilltop on landing road where the two Union uh, attacks went off, Ewell held, a depleted but he held, held. However, of incredible note, this depleted Union cav uh, infantry unit, Rodman's unit, pushed back the elite hood all the way through, completely routing them and driving them through, creating a pathway for the north. Skimmon's green troops moved forward. They are within range of the baggage trains to win the battle. And it's going to go down to the last turn. Now, and the baggage trains can't move, so the South has to go first. If the North can go first, it's, it's going to come down to the last roll. It's, it's basically going to be whoever can move the quickest to seize the victory here. Just to the left, um, both troops pushed back. Uh, er, French's troops were pushed back here, as well as Fitz Lee's cavalry, who had filled the gap here, both driving back. So there is another hole here. But this is the biggest of the holes. And then over here to the west, the, uh, of kind of important note here, the Confederate cavalry opened fire on Wilcox's depleted troops and blew them away as they charged the, the artillery lines here. The uh, Union forces were able to then push forward and drive back the artillery. However, rather than risk losing their eighth unit, this unit retreated here. This was Sturgis retreated. So as we head to the final turn and the sun is setting, the long shadows stretch across the fields to the west of Sharpsburg. It all comes down to who can get here first or Perhaps, because if the, if the Confederates can take the initiative and get in front of this and block it, it's going to be the victory for them. If they can't, it's going to be a win for the, the uh, Union forces. We'll go now to the last turn and see who moves and see how this plays out. Potentially, though, a Northern victory if Scammon can go first or someone around them can go first. As the sun settles, we have a victor. The initiative went first to the Southern Cavalry. They were hoping to move forward to try to plug the holes in the lines here to prevent the surge through to reach the baggage trains. However, Burnside tried to send Skimmon's unit forward, the, the Ninth Corps. They failed their initiative. However, French's infantry over here, which has just enough movement to be able to make it, won the initiative. They were going to go first in the last hour and a half, which would allow them to get up here. I tried to have both First Corps and Second Corps seize the initiative and go before them. They need a one to four roll. Both of them failed their rolls again at a critical moment, both Jackson and Longstreet not being able to organize their troops quickly enough to rally for victory to hold off the defeat. I also had the uh, Union Cavalry here, which has definitely has, an, this is close, honestly, but this cavalry has definitely has enough movement to get there and can change facing. It, it works out really well. They get the initiative as well. So we can imagine the Union cavalry surging forward, coming up into here, taking the Confederate baggage train, breaking the lines, and the victory goes to the north. That brings us to the conclusion. Thank you, everybody, for watching. I'm trying to see some other ways that the South could have won this, but there's no way they could have gotten that artillery to fire through this or gotten this artillery to fire through this. It was unrescuable once the, the, the cavalry here broke through and, and kind of drove through that final hole. Just too many losses for the South to uh, withstand. And I think especially as it's th their whole collapse started with the Union artillery hitting some desperate and incredibly uh, tenacious fire here to drive them back from the sunken road. Once this sunken road line fell, 
it went quickly across this clear terrain here because there really isn't good defensive positions. Southern losses were mounting up and they just had to kind of pull back and do the best they can. And I think it got, it, you know, with the map edge here, it gets a little bit perhaps gamey here. I would think that perhaps, you know, historically this would have fallen back in a line, but that's one of, one of the concessions we're maybe making to kind of map size here. I, I'm not sure we've historically answered the question about uh, McClellan's uh, kind of, if, if McClellan were bold and daring, what would have happened? But I do think uh, part of the answer here is that kind of using the superiority of numbers. Having said that, the Union, you know, this could have gone either way. The Union was one infantry unit away from defeat. And early on, the South was actually only two units away from defeat, too. So uh, these elite units of the South are really tough to uh, take out. Even the cavalry is elite here, too. It just makes it hard to knock them out which means that you're kind of struggling as the Union to try to find casualties you can extract. And then, um, yeah, I mean, some of it here too, it, you know, is swingy with the four to five, six hits. You can have one attack go really well. This final defense in here, getting Hood's elite units driven off was remarkably lucky. It took three hits to do that. And that kind of is what opened up un unlikely opportunity for the North to break through the lines here too. Uh, tremendously fun. I think in terms of impressions on how the game play, I, I really enjoy this game. This is a lot of fun. I will say um, a couple things. You know, This is very much a miniatures experience and this is really my first time playing miniatures. Now I've played this game uh, twice with the lead play tester for these games and so he's helped me a lot to understand them. I still feel like this is a little bit of like me speaking a foreign language. You know, there's there's cases where I'm not quite sure, like, could the unit do that? Can it move through there? There's kind of, you know, the majority of the piece has to fit, and I think I'm right, but I'm never quite sure. And I think that's probably more on me with experience with the system and with the experience of playing miniatures. So, you know, with that in mind, there's probably some mistakes in here, some errors in here that I made, uh, just as I'm kind of learning in another world with wargaming, if you would, that is definitely more kind of a miniatures experience. There's no structure to the movement in terms of hexes and things like that. So this was a learning experience for me. Um, I will say, I do find the rules are very simple. I do feel like my, my own if I were to label a critique at the game, uh, I do feel like the rules could be expanded upon to clarify some edge cases. I would like to see more examples. I think perhaps if you are coming to it from a miniatures background, maybe you don't need that. But if you're not, if you're new to this type of game, I felt like more examples in the rules would be helpful. I felt like covering some of the edge cases and perhaps a little better organization of the rules. They're not complex at all. I just really struggled sometimes to find some of the answers um, in, in certain places in the rules. And part of that's on me again with the miniatures, but but I do think there is, I think the rules could be, could be improved upon for helping players in my type of a situation, and maybe that's you. Um, would I recommend this game? Absolutely. This is really fun. It's fun if you're just a fan of gaming and you're a, you know, if you are a gamer and you are a war gamer, I feel like this is a little bit of stepping outside of your comfort zone to play something that's very, very different. And I have really enjoyed this. I'm glad this game is in my collection. I really like this game and it's really, really fun. I had a good time. And I do feel like, you know, you can explore hypothetical history questions with this. I think each time it's gonna play out differently. Yes, it's definitely, there are some, there is an element of swinginess to it with the dice. The Union artillery to blow a hole in the sunken road here was extraordinarily fortunate. They also had some hits up here. They rolled nine consecutive rolls. They rolled four fives or fives or sixes, I think it was. They had to get to get the two hits to drive these units out. So they got really lucky rolls to, to kind of create some opportunities for them to attack. But yeah, very fun system. Uh, you know, there are a lot of games in this pub battle system up. There is a link down in the description for, you know, if you want to explore more on their website. I'd be happy to answer questions and things that uh, have come up, but thank you again for watching. I hope you've enjoyed this series, and I think we can, we can say at least in this historical alternative, a, a hyper-aggressive in the end, a very hyper-aggressive, leading almost a very unlikely attack by McClellan at the end here, did turn out to prove victorious. So maybe that does give us a little bit of an inclination, a little bit of a, a, a hint here that perhaps a Bolden McClellan could have won the day in a grander fashion at Antietam. Thank you so much for watching, everybody. I look forward to reading your comments down below. Take care.